For the first episode, we're headed down to Heinemann, Kentucky, where Lindsay's family's from. My grandfather went to the Heinemann Settlement School, and I would tell Maggie about memories of that a lot. So when we started to look into where we wanted to take the farmer and the foodie, Heinemann was sort of a natural fit. We've been reading this book by Ronnie Lundy, her Vittles cookbook, which is incredible, and we were really inspired to take a road trip and see what food in the mountains is like. I'm always on the farm, and Lindsay's usually in her kitchen, and so to get us out and inspired by other people is really important. We aim to educate viewers to learn how to cook from real ingredients for their family and friends. And we also want to encourage viewers to access those ingredients from their local farmers. There's these beautiful rural landscapes, there's these tiny little towns, and I'm ready to explore them and I'm ready to see what they're cooking and what's growing in their gardens. It does not take long for you to realize that you're headed to the mountains. Once you get going, the road starts to curve, the sky, you know, sort of opens up and there's just these beautiful rolling hills in front of you that slowly get higher and taller. We really were excited to understand what the community embraces in Hindman, the traditions of Appalachia, and there was really no better place to do that than the Hindman Settlement School. When we were driving to Hindman Settlement School, we were really excited to experience this together. Lindsay and I see ourselves as a family, and we're best friends, and we'll do anything, try anything together. <laughs> What's going on this week? So the the folk festival. How long has this been happening? This is the 40th anniversary okay. of the Appalachian uh, Family Folk Week. So 40, wow. they've been doing this here at Troublesome Creek for 40 years. First week of June, and it's really largely made up of people who have a past in Appalachia. Maybe it's a family connection, or they have some tie to it somehow, or just a real interest. And they come here and stay the week and learn traditional Appalachian music, dance, craft, uh -huh. that sort of thing. And have a, a family experience, really. I mean, yeah. it was set up for there to be families bringing their children so that their children would learn the traditions. The moment we walked in, we've been smelling the cake and the cobbler. So it's apple stack cake sort of fused with gingerbread. So I know there's a gingerbread festival in Hindman every year. Tell me a little bit about, like, where that came from and what inspires that interest in ginger here. Many, many decades ago, gingerbread was often traded back and forth as, for political favors. Uh, if somebody in your family got in trouble and they needed some sort of favor from a local person who was in power or a person of influence, they may not be able to give them money, but they could give them gingerbread. And so they would trade that. And so that kind of just stuck. And I think people in the region, as a result of that, have really tied into loving gingerbread. Oh, I love it. Now this is this will be very, very fun. We'd love to try to make this at home. Do you mind to share the recipe with no, us? No, we'd love to. Okay, good. Yeah. Good, good, good. And anything all la mode is always that much better. <laughs> That's so. right. <laughs> it is good. Get back to ride. Get back home, swing your own. There she is. About two hours in, I thought, I'm for sure bringing my family next year to this. When we were square dancing, my cheeks hurt just from smiling so big. It was really fun to just kick back, enjoy some fun with Lindsay, and learn something new. The next day, Maggie did what she did best and went out to check out the gardens that are going on. And I was excited to see that rural Appalachia really gives all the tools that people need and all the infrastructure to allow people to just focus on being good gardeners and be able to learn the most that they can. The biggest thing I was excited about was to actually meet the farmers that were behind Grow Appalachia. Hey, how are you? Good. I'm Maggie. Candace. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Hi. Hi, I'm Chris. Hi, Chris. I'm Maggie. Thanks nice for having us out to your garden. Anytime. <laughs> I was really curious about what Grow Appalachia's role was and what the individual's role was. 
Uh, Grow Up Alacha is a rural food security project. We teach families how to grow their own food. We work with partner sites like Heinemann Settlement Schools to um, basically administer a gardening program so people can learn how to grow their own food again, uh, put it up for the winter, and eat healthy year-round. It was really impressive to see Candace let um, all the gardeners just do their thing and make each garden unique to their space and their personality. I had peas here on the fence, and after I pulled the peas off, then I put my beans out there. The moment I stepped into her garden, I really felt at ease and comfortable, and it's so nice to get a tour of someone's garden with the person who loves it so much. Yeah, I'm going to be cooking some peas in the kitchen with my friend Lindsay. Oh, are you? Yeah, so well. we're going to make a pea salad, which I'm really excited about. Do you put anything in your pea salad? I don't usually make pea salad. I would use them with the hull on them. Okay. And uh, I usually just put a piece of bacon and a little bacon grease in them <laughs> and salt, <laughs> which isn't really good for you, but that's the way I like them. So. Yeah, I like them that way too. Yeah. <laughs> and your cabbages, what do you do with your cabbages? Most of the time we just eat them fresh. We don't usually, I got something eating on them. Yeah, but yeah, most of the time I just eat them fresh. Oh, it's worms. Yeah, it's the cabbage worms. Okay. So do I need to spray them? Um, you could spray them, but we'll see if we can find any because you may have already taken care of it and this is just residue. Oh, see, here's one right here. So I just squish them. So that's the best way to remove them is just... Yeah, you just look on each leaf. I mean, I know it's kind of tedious, but kids love doing this, so your grandson could help you. <laughs> I, I use, oh, here. Here's, see, they're so hard to see, too, so you can make it like a game to be able to see them. Well, now you are looper free. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Christine ended up actually having plenty of food for her whole family. She even talked about having some that she could give away. And so you could see that pride in her ability to give something to her grandson, give something to her children, so that they could really understand where their food's coming from and understand the heritage that she saw growing up. This is the first year we've done this garden here. Um, the land belongs to Bob and Gail. Um, they, Bob grew up on this land in this house up here. No one lives there right now. When I heard about Bobby, he sounded like a jack of all trades. When we pulled up, he was working and, you know, someone that is a gardener like that, I hate to disturb them because I know what it's like when you're getting in the middle of a task. This is so cool. Is this working as a deer fence? So far, and yeah. this, there was a lot of deer poop here when we first started, so we know yeah. there's a lot of deer, but so far it's deterred them. That's cool. a good thing. And what are these beans growing? Greasy beans. As long as you treat the vines nice, they grow till the first frost. Yeah. You know, as long as you're not too rough with the vines as far as the greasy beans. And you save seed, I'm assuming. Oh, yes. Well, I have a present for you. So this is a greasy bean I've been saving the seed from for a while. Oh, all right. So a partridge head pole bean and it was passed down to me from another farmer. So. Oh, a white one or is it a striped? No, it, it's really cool looking. Um, it has- Tennessee? Yeah, from Tennessee in the 1800s. Oh, wow, that's a big greasy bean Isn't that too. nice? Yeah. Something that Grow Up Lodger encourages is, is for us to kind of, you know, save local heirloom seeds and give them out to participants. So last year, we grew out a couple rows of these greasy beans, saved the seeds, and then just a couple months ago, we gave out the seeds so participants can grow them at home and, and keep them going. Some of the people that we have in our program though, they, they've never planted a seed either, you know. We've had some young ladies, uh, probably early 20s, and they planted their onion seeds, well, their onion sets, and once the onions got a little green on it, it's like they'd won the lottery, just <laughs> seeing that little bit of green onion, and that makes me happy. So how did you get involved with Grow Appalachia? Well, actually, the guy that worked at the Hyman Settlement School, I knew him from Letcher County, Brent Ratliff, the music, kind of the music scene over there. I'm the only guy who really knew that farmed in Knott County, so we asked me, and yeah, I was on board instantly. 
didn't ask anything other than when do I start? Yeah. So, because I do this at home. He loved connecting with people. He loved talking to people. He had the tools and experience and equipment and he just loved showing other people the gift of growing food straight from seed to your table. Do you need help with anything? As far as, I would uh, love to help you. Well, I could, I could stand the bar ten dollars. <laughs> 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 I don't know, I did this stuff most of my life. Even when I was younger, my mom, she had me out picking beans and stuff before I ever went to school. Those foggy, cool mornings, you're out there and it's quiet. Each day you can come out and you see that little bit of growth. I just enjoy it. back in the kitchen, I really wanted to see the general food prep, how they ran everything. And the first thing you could tell is the same sense of community in the dining room is reflected in the kitchen. They're all really excited to be there and working together and no one wanted to take credit for anything. It was very, very sweet. It was definitely a team effort and a really warm atmosphere. And the one person they kept um, referencing, you need to talk to Anne, you need to talk to Anne. Well, Anne actually went to the Hyman Settlement School herself. And it's so nice to meet you. Nice and to meet you. so you were sharing a little bit with me. You're from here and you went to the settlement school, is that right? Yes, I did. Yeah, when did you come here as a student? I graduated in 1965. Uh, oh my gosh. I stayed in the dorms here. Okay, okay. So my grandfather actually did the same thing. He was the oldest of 12, born and raised here in Hindman. And he would um, walk on Sundays. They'd take him about half day or more over the mountain yeah. and come here. Yeah. And you were saying you did something I very did similar. I did the same thing. Yeah. 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 They'd meet us on the other side of the mountain and bring uh -huh. us up here. That's amazing. I'm from Lexington, so they okay. moved there. But growing up, Hindman was always very much a part of the conversation and you know he left the mountains but he was always a mountain boy yeah. is that something you can relate to absolutely yeah absolutely yeah. what does yeah. being from Hyman mean to you oh this I tell you the settlement itself means the world to me yeah I love it it just uh you know it enhanced my life it gave me mm -hmm. uh, a better life I believe if it wasn't for the, the Hyman settlement school here and and some of the farmers left here in Hyman I believe the culture would just kind of disappear Sure. And they're trying to not let that happen, and I'm glad, yeah. happy about that. What does the Hyman Settlement School look like today compared to what it looked like in you know, the early 1900s? Our vision has been to meet the changing needs of our community. Our founders set that up and in a lot of ways that gives us a broad path to follow. We want to continue to be connected to educational opportunities. We want people to be proud of the area they come from and so a lot of the work we do always goes back to that. Our cultural heritage programs are largely set up through workshops and weeks like what we do here with Folk Week. Uh -huh. We have weekends throughout the year that deal with anything from folk art traditions to writing. There's a great literary history here at Hyman Settlement oh, yeah. School. And then we also do work in community service. And so our food outreach is a big part of that. Mm -hmm. And we have great partnerships with people in the community. So we work with other organizations to help make sure that they can serve in the community without obstacles. Everyone we've met, you can tell they just really, really love where they're from. Yeah, I think that people who are from the mountains, wherever you are, Hindman or Louisa yeah. where I'm from or wherever it might be, no matter if you leave, this is always home. Home has lots of different images for different people, but they're always thinking about how to get back somehow. It was nice having the drive back with Lindsay. We were able to talk about the things we saw in the garden and what we were excited to cook and just reflecting on why we love food and farming and why we love to visit people and talk to people. We were both just completely over the moon with the experience and um, really we're ready to stay longer. I'm still buzzing from Hyman. I that know. was so nice. I know. Meeting so many fun farmers. Oh my gosh. It, like, I, I keep thinking about all the different people we met, and it was super inspiring. And the whole time, I just kept thinking about I wanted to come back and cook. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
One of the things that I was most excited to recreate that we had was the apple sat cake cobbler. Yeah, because that was just like super delicious. We're gonna have you help me. Okay. I'm just gonna put a whole bunch of things in a bowl. So first we have um, about four cups of dried apples, and this is one of the cooking traditions that they help to preserve at the settlement school. Here's a bunch of apple cider to really Yum. drive the apple point home. So if you just wanna pour all of that in, we're gonna rehydrate these guys. And then make sure we have plenty of sweetness going. So there's about a third cup of sugar in there. And then a little lemon juice, if you wanna add that in for me. And then a pinch of salt. Okay, I'm glad nice. to see we're spicing things yes. up. Yes. This is just the beginning of the spice. Pinch of nutmeg. And then cinnamon is really the predominant flavor here. And then once this comes to a boil, we're gonna reduce it down to a simmer. Basically, we just want them to start to rehydrate. So now we need to make the batter that's gonna be poured on top. So if you just wanna go ahead and put light sugar in there, dark brown sugar, then sorghum. Sorghum is a great replacement for like honey or any traditional sugars. It really is this dense, hearty, delicious ending to a meal. And if you wanna crack an egg in there as well, and then all we need to add left is some vanilla. Okay, now for our dry ingredients. Okay. So I'm gonna start, we've got cake flour in here, not all purpose, cake oh, flour. okay. Yes, and if you wanna go ahead and add about one and a half teaspoons baking powder, and then just a little bit, about a quarter teaspoon of baking soda is perfect. Now we are gonna add so many yummy spices. So we're starting with cinnamon and we are gonna do about two and a quarter teaspoons of cinnamon. We're gonna do about a half teaspoon of ginger. And another spice they had in there is cardamom, mm. which I really found interesting, and um, we're gonna do about a half teaspoon of that, but I thought that was a really different, neat spice. I mean, I love how cardamom oh, yeah. smells. Yeah, but it's not something I smell and immediately think dessert. Mm -hmm. So I really like the, like it gives it a really earthy depth of flavor. And then finally, we're gonna add just a little bit of clove, just about a quarter teaspoon clove. A quarter teaspoon salt? Yes. And then, Maggie, over on the stove, we've got some butter that we've yeah. melted and cooled, and then we've also got buttermilk. So okay, so actually, we're gonna hold okay. off on that. We're gonna first add this in to the wet ingredients, the sugars yeah. we've had going over there, and then that's gonna be our final addition. I love just a good one pot roast chicken. I think it's extremely accessible. It is extremely flavorful and it's really, really easy and adaptable. Standard things that I like to do with any chicken I cook is to brine it. This is where you can get creative and impart whatever flavors you want. But essentially it's just this lovely yummy bath that we then put the chicken in and let it sit in for a while. That bone is gonna give it so much flavor, as is the skin. It's gonna make sure that moisture stays in there even more. We're gonna sear the chicken, and then we're gonna add some aromatics that were inspired by things we saw in the gardens, like some onions and some garlic. I love cast iron. One of my main reasons I love it is because you can start on the stove top and then pop it in the oven. In the spirit of what we we're making today and celebrating the apple, we're gonna put some apple cider in there. Oh, so this is, so this is some apple cider, yeah. So we're gonna add about a cup. Okay, so all we gotta do now is bake it. Coming back, Maggie was filling me all in on her experience in the gardens, and one of the biggest ingredients that she was excited to see them cultivating were peas. And so we're excited to make a traditional pea salad. One cool thing about peas that I love, in my garden at least, is that it adds so much nutrients to your soil. And it fixes nitrogen and is a great cover crop to just put right back into the soil. Mm -hmm. And the worms, of course, love that, and so do all <laughs> the other bugs. So to shell them, I basically start with the rib here, and then bring that string down, and then open it up. Oh, yeah, and then perfect. you have the perfect little set of peas in a pod. It reminds me though, when we went to the Hyman Settlement School, there was a lot of 
hand work. And this is a wonderful way to keep your hands entertained yeah. while enjoying conversation with friends. Yeah, well it totally takes me to a place of like envisioning my ancestors who were there mm -hmm. sitting on their front porches and yeah. like turning butter and doing yeah. all those things and getting, you know, milk and cream, um, which is actually what is used for the dressing for the salad. Basically, um, we've got about a half a cup of cream here. Then I'm gonna add some apple cider vinegar and then just about like a splash of honey, like a quarter teaspoon or so. And then um, you just shake it for like wow. one minute. So I guess it gets like really nice and frothy. And then we let it sit at room temperature for about an hour. And it really just kind of infuses and gets thickened. And then um, what we're gonna do with these peas, I think we've got probably, probably got about enough there. We're gonna pop them in a pot of boiling water and just blanch them for like one minute. Because we want them to stay, I mean what's so nice is how like fresh and crisp they are. Mm -hmm. So we don't want them to lose that. it is mm -hmm. and how the cream is kind of cool but you've got the peppery bite from the radish and it makes me feel like I want to enjoy this again and hang in with like that mountain air. Yes. That's one of the first oh. things we noticed. You were like, I'm on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I was really excited just to invite our husbands over and share our experience with them and take the time to sit down, relax and reflect. Right. Cheers. 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 This Cheers. Looks awesome. I know. Enjoy our Appalachian feast, guys. Yeah. Okay. Benson? Yes, please. Nice. Not gonna lie. So we actually have these photos. This is one from the settlement school. Um, years and years and years ago. Oh, yeah. My grandfather is right. There, he's that guy right there. What is that? Yeah. Right. yeah. And if you've ever oh, seen my dad, before. you know, yeah. <laughs> Wow. So when yeah. was this? When is this day so back? So he here? went there um, in the 20s and 30s. So that's, as you can see, very dated. Yes. Um, but he grew up in Hindman with Treasure. his 11 younger siblings. This yeah. is the first time they were all together. Actually, it's from 1949, and it was the first time the entire family, all the children, were in one place. But that is in the the hills and the mountains. I of love Hindman. those outfits. I know. Oh my god. I know. <laughs> But yeah, so it was it was really special. Maggie and I got to meet some really neat people, mm. and I know, you know, while I didn't spend a lot of time in Hyman growing up, that was such a really ever-present like aspect of my family's culture and life, and I think we got to really experience that with the people we met there. You know, Lindsay got to go back yeah. in the kitchen. And yes, I did. I met this wonderful woman named Anne who um, actually went to settlement school like Granddaddy. And it was also really neat to then meet people from Grappalacha who use traditional methods to be, you know, make progressive steps. A lot of these people were gardening to show their grandkids. Mm -hmm. And so they're Wonderful. wanting to make sure to keep that heritage going and keep those traditions going. And so, yeah, yeah that was sweet. In it. Yeah. yeah. For me, it was very nostalgic and yet at the same time really um, enlightening and moving. Yeah. Yeah. I felt like what we did and what we ate really reflected upon and was inspired by our experience in Hangman. And you know, we weren't in the mountains, but we got to be around a table together with our husbands and reflect upon all that we had taken away. Getting creative outside of your normal day-to-day -day life and inspired by other people is really important. Getting to see and then highlight people doing such amazing things that, you know, I was unaware of. It makes me feel really, really proud and really excited for what the show represents, and I feel like it really fulfills the mission of what we're trying to do. Yeah.